I'll start sharing a little bit about what we do in We The Teachers. We always start with researchers. So we look into the schools and then we try to understand what each school is facing, what are the challenges, what are the needs, and what are the circumstances that go around um, their challenges in doing something better for the students. So we look into the different cases because there's no one-size-fits-all kind of approach towards the school development. And then after we do the research, then we do what we call knowledge sharing, which usually it comes in the form of teacher training or workshops or just some kind of like sharing expertise between teachers or bringing in other experts as well. And then the next one, we um, also make sure that whatever we do, whatever we discuss, will translate into a tangible action and interaction within the classrooms, right? The beneficiary of the education system should be none other than the students. So we make sure that it is translated well into the classrooms. We have a classroom observation um, element, which is uh, also making sure that our work is sustainable because then the teachers are very comfortable in criticizing each other, in uh, giving feedbacks to each other. And then obviously the loop closes back to the research element because we want to look at the impacts of what we do we want to make sure that everything is quantifiable and we can be accountable, not just to the schools and to the teachers, but also to the greater community in which we are part of. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what we the teachers do uh, with school development through teachers training. But um, why we do what we do, I'd like to ask a question first. Um, can someone share what they remember learning from their primary school days? Yes. About ancient Egypt and the hieroglyphics. Okay, ancient Egypt and um, their writings, right? Anyone else remember what they learned from primary school? Yes. Right angle triangles. <laughs> right angle triangles, all right. So everyone learned that, right? But see, what we're trying to see here is there is a disconnect between what students are learning in schools and what they're actually facing in workforce. So for instance, ancient Egypt, how does it relate to what you do right now? Quite probably zero or like 0.1 percent, right? And then there's the right angle triangle, which is probably useful when you are an engineer or you know when you're working in um, the related field. But as we see here, the way we learn in classrooms, um, the way we count in this case, is different than what is expected by employers when they look for uh, employees, which is what um, Henry will elaborate later on in his session. So there is this disconnect, uh, which of course, this is a homework for everyone, including the teachers, including everyone, um, the stakeholders as well. And partially, this is actually a result of another duality in the education system. What happens at the parliament, this is the parliament in Indonesia, where a lot of people in suits are discussing and making decisions about what happens in classrooms. But then obviously, the decisions made here is different than what is happening in the schools. Oh, we want to have a universal curriculum, same thing for everyone in all the 17,000 islands of Indonesia. But in reality, what they face every day, what they understand as math, what they understand as science, and what kind of future and expectations the students and the parents have are very, very different than what the policy makers have in mind. These are some of the challenges that we face. But then there's also something else related to what the World Economic Forum has been sounding a lot, which is the fourth industrial revolution, where we see that right now, everything we do is digitalized. The way we order a cap, the way we get food on our table, the way we communicate, and all this interaction is obviously affecting the way students process information. But then there's also the traditional values that I think is very much part of the ASEAN society's fabric. Values such as respect, values such as hard work, values such as you have to be respectful to your elders, things like that that are kind of taking a um, second priority maybe compared to other disruptions that is happening in the world. And meanwhile, uh, in the case of Indonesia and perhaps other countries in the region as well, the nationalism is more and more losing its place in the schools. So what do they understand as the national curriculum? What do they understand as the national pedagogy? national values. It's very much missing and it's putting a serious threat uh, in the country's unity and democracy and uh, other elements that keep all this diversity together. But I'd like to end this on a slightly more optimistic note because we're all here and we're trying to make solution and improving the state of the world. The faith 
in education, the faith in schooling is still very much thick. You ask every parent of all socioeconomic levels, uh, from farmers who earn $4 a day, to um, people who work in corporate and earning a lot and being able to send their kids to international high quality uh, schools, they still believe in education. They still believe that a diploma, a degree, and some kind of schooling, formal schooling, will be able to yield their offspring's better livelihood and better economic um, lives and conditions. Um, so the faith in schooling is still really high, and it is an asset that we could leverage um, together, because I think all of us, regardless of our roles in the society, as teachers, as um, people from the private sector, as government bodies, we all could benefit from a more literate, from a more creative, from a more critical human resources. So that's from me. I'd like to pass it on to Henry, who will bring it to a more real workforce um, scenario. Thank you very much. So every student wants an education that leads to employment. This is a very utilitarian view, but if you live in countries such as the Philippines with a lot of um, economic inequality, it's actually a very practical one. Um, education will be the social elevator that helps students um, go into a higher socioeconomic group. So everyone agrees to this, and the reasons are quite simple. In the Philippines, if you finish college, over your lifetime you'll earn $15,000 more than someone who just finished high school. As a result, 75% of all Filipino families, regardless of their background, want their kids to go to college. So the government knows this, the students want this, and yet, something's gone wrong in the last 20 or 30 years. Today, youth unemployment in the Philippines is about 25%. If you ever hear official statistics that tell you that it's less, I think that's called alternative facts. You have the same issue across other parts of ASEAN. So what has gone wrong? Is the issue that there's not enough jobs? Actually, not really. In the Philippines, you have more than a million openings that are hard to fill, where employers are complaining that it's difficult to get fresh grads to do these jobs. Is it the fault of the education system? Is there not enough choice? Well, we have 2,000 universities. That's actually two or three times more per capita than the US. Are people not spending enough money? Six billion dollars a year, growing at 6%, which is three times our population rate. You tell me if we're not spending enough. The root cause is a little bit more subtle. The first one is that students are taking courses that employers don't really care about. This happened a couple of years ago where a lot of students were taking up nursing irrespective of whether there were nursing jobs waiting for them. And we ended up with a surplus of 200,000 graduates. That's 200,000 lives wasted for four years. The other issue, which is more pervasive, is that education doesn't quite prepare you for the world of employment. Everyone wants uh, employees who speak English and who can you know, handle basic math. But what about being proactive? What about being reliable? What about project management? These are the kind of skills that employers look for. And unfortunately, many educational institutions in the Philippines are not teaching those skills. And that is why 50% of college graduates in the Philippines do not find jobs. So can we help those kids? So the work we do at Educacion.ph is to try to help um, students make better decisions. We believe that um, technology can actually go a long way in terms of reducing information asymmetry. Understanding what subjects are out there, understanding the different universities that offer them, the tuition costs, the academic quality, perhaps even more importantly, whether those schools are having real efforts in linking with employers. These are all metrics which, quite frankly, if a student had these, they would be able to make a better decision. The reality is technology will play some part in fixing that issue, but it's not gonna be enough. First of all, you're gonna need very good content in terms of career pathways. It's not enough to just list all the schools out there. You have to explain to them, okay, these are the different industries in the Philippines. This is what people do in those industries. These are the skills that they need. This, by the way, is how much you'll get paid as an entry-level analyst, and this is how much you'll get paid if you ever rise to the top. And then suddenly, if you can understand the path in front of you, it's a lot easier to try to chart your journey. But technology is not enough. You may wonder what those Igor Tribes folks are doing on this image. And apart from looking at you, they're actually reminding us that it takes a village to raise a child. Technology in itself is insufficient. We have found that working with government, which has the resources and the reach into the public school system, working with corporations, which are the ones that know what kind of employees that they want, who know what skills are lacking in the education system, to work with parents, parents who often need to have a bit more of an open attitude in terms of what kind of careers their children can take and not just push everyone into engineering or law school. We even try to work with schools, and not just any schools, but also the guidance counselors, um, the principals, 
And it's only if you align all these stakeholders together can you actually get um, the end of the mismatch, that you can bridge education and employment. So I've spoken to you about a lot of the different solutions, technology involving different stakeholders, but I want to step back and end on an open-ended note. It's very easy for countries with high youth unemployment to try to look up to countries who seem to have solved it, the Switzerlands, the Singapores, the Finlands of this world, and to think, ah, if only Indonesia and the Philippines could be like those countries, maybe we just need to copy the education system. Unfortunately, that is not going to be the solution. We will need to come up with our own tailored solutions to the um, shortcomings of our education system. And these will come in many forms. There will be no silver bullet. There will be no single policy or single expenditure that will set us on the right path. Instead, it will be everything from literacy programs for students and adults to virtual reality immersion programs. I think as long as every stakeholder in education to employment understands that students need to be trained for the world of employment, I remain very hopeful for the future of today's youth. Thank you very much. Yes, and we would now like to open for questions. In terms of education, um, what would be needed to be done to ensure that the gap in terms of education in the city and the rural parts would be somewhat along the same line and, and the rural areas would not fall back to a, yeah, to a point of where it's just not relevant anymore? Answering to that, I think there are two uh, layers to um, making sure that students or kids in the rural areas are on par with their peers. Firstly, of course, there's the infrastructure, right? Because when we compare uh, Phnom Penh and Jakarta or especially to Kuala Lumpur or Singapore, the infrastructure is very much different and that affects the connectivity, that affects the way you can get information, you can interact with one another. So technology might be there, but then if it's not connected um, and there's no access, then it will be hard. So there's infrastructure, which we all know is a very big homework that takes not just educators, of course, there's government, there's uh, banks and everyone else. I'd like to share um, what I call Google Goggle because I feel right now um, as teachers or as uh, parents, we lose our sole authority on knowledge. Why? Because they have Googles. But then what is important for us adults, uh, teachers and parents to put on is really the goggle. Um, so it's the mindset and the perspective that they would have in getting all those information, processing those information and weighing the decision, being a rural kid for instance, whether I want to stay in my village, develop this area, or I want to move to the urban city and then fight in the concrete jungle. So something along that line. One of the things that we see in Malaysia a great deal is employers talking about not the quality of the education that the um, prospective employees have gotten, but the challenge of um, attitudes and behaviors in the workplace. And so I'm wondering, you know, this conversation is really about the, the quality of education, but I'm wondering how you're looking at and thinking about um, prospective employees in a more holistic way to be responsive to employer needs? It's, a, it's actually a very serious topic and one of the things we try to do is to specifically explain what a career looks like. So sometimes the reason why students who graduate will not do very well in a job is they didn't even know what the job entailed in the first place. They'll have a very vague idea of like, oh, this is what a computer scientist does or oh, okay, I, I think I can be an accountant. And so what we do is we do these career conversations where we actually ask people at entry level, mid-level, and top level positions to actually explain the pros and cons of being in their industry. So, you know, if you think you can be a doctor and save lives, absolutely, that's fantastic. If you don't like working night shifts, you will never be a successful doctor, so you should not even bother going to med school. And we ask every person we interview to be very candid about what's difficult about the job. And the idea is it's a little bit, the more open you are about the challenges, the more people will come in eyes wide open. Obviously, then you'll always have bad apples, but we think that being very upfront about the difficulties in a certain industry will help filter people. What specifically have you done and to which extent is what you've done with whatever number of schools a, a, replica mo a repli replicable model that can actually be rolled out to other schools in the Philippines but also beyond? Where we go and we train anyone who's involved in the school, whether that's the parents, the guidance counselors, the teachers, on how to even understand education to employment. And that's even basic things like oh, this is, these are the college options. By the way, half of college grads will not find a job, so this is why getting the right college degree actually matters. And so it's changing this mindset of, oh, if my kid goes to college, I'm fine. He goes to college, he's going to earn more money when he's older, and he's going to have a higher chance of getting a job. The second thing is we actually teach the students how to use the website, because 
the website is almost like a trip advisor. And so if you're a very type A student, you will love it. You will find so much information, and you'll use it and you'll research it. If you're not as type A, you might just see and be like, oh, that's a lot of choice. It's, it's a bit scary. We think it's replicable because it's a website, so you can actually promote it in any school. And so that's why we don't actually, the schoolwork we do, we limit to certain schools because it's the fastest way is just to get people to use the website. Uh, going to every school in every province is very cost intensive and not very scalable. We'd like to go outside into other ASEAN markets, but we'd need local content there. So the content you would be pushing on a Indonesian student would have to be about Indonesian opportunities. I don't think they care that much about Filipino colleges. A lot of the conversation we've been hearing over the last day or so has been around how education can be a key part of the solution in tackling a range of global challenges, you know, be it climate or sustainability or other issues. Um, what do you see as the role of education, particularly in schools, to tackle these issues and enable you know, students to go out and, and be well placed to address these issues? And how are you going about that or seeing that being done? School is not an unfamiliar feeling, right? We all were part of some schooling system for some years. Um, but I think the issue here is really the commitment to actually invest time and money in the education system. Why? Because the education as, a, as an industry, the nature is very intangible, dealing with brains and information and knowledge. So it's, it's not easily graspable and it's very abstract. And then um, also education is very long term. So it's not like you are investing your time, your money in a certain student or a certain school, and then you actually see the change happening in the next hour or the next day. To have that commitment, um, solid commitment to the education system, I think that is where the issue is. It is uh, a, a together work, a collective work between all parties. And again, we will all benefit from a more critical uh, and more literate society.